Okay, hello, uh, welcome back. So at the end of the previous lecture, I mentioned that uh, many of those biological aspects of, of learning and memory, they're rel uh, related to cell signaling, signaling communication between cells. So I decided to prepare some lectures on biosignaling uh, in which I'm going to just explain uh, the basic basics of biosignaling, the principles of biosignaling, and some of the co concepts which are relevant to the cellular and molecular aspects of learning and memory. So the outline for <coughs> uh, the series of lectures in biosignaling is that in the first couple of uh, lectures, I'm going to explain the basic features of cell signaling, common concepts and principles. Uh, I'm going to define what is biosignaling in, uh, in the first place, what are signals, uh, how signals are re uh, received by the cells, how they are processed by the cells, some, some basic concepts. Um, then in other videos, I'm going to focus on the key molecules involved in cell signaling. Uh, for instance, uh, G proteins, uh, kinase enzymes, phosphatase uh, uh, proteins, and those uh, key molecules which are common in, in uh, various signaling pathways. And uh, I'm also going to focus on some basic signaling pathways. Um, why basic? Well, uh, as I'm going to explain later, signaling pathways, signal transduction pathways can sometimes get very messy and complicated. So I'm just going to focus on the basic ones. The outline for this lecture, uh, right, uh, I want to present right now, is that first I'm going to introduce um, some terms and some concepts first. Uh, <clears throat> then I'm going to focus on the, uh, you know, I'm going to give you a general picture of cell signaling, what happens generally when we are talking about cell signaling. Um, uh, what happens when a signal is received by a single cell uh, and how it is processed. Then I'm going to talk about messengers, which are very important in the very important concepts in cell signaling. Uh, different types of them, you know, first messengers, second messengers, how they're produced and the roles in cell signaling. I'm going to talk about ligands and receptors. Again, uh, common and important uh, key concepts in uh, biosignal. So this is uh, Barbara McClintock, a bright woman, an American cytogenetist uh, who won a Nobel Prize in Physiology or Medicine uh, for her work on the genetic structure of corn. And um, in his Nobel Prize acceptance lecture in 1983, she said that a goal for the future uh, would be to determine the extent of the knowledge the cell has of itself and how it utilizes this knowledge in a thoughtful manner when challenged. So scientists at that time knew the fact that uh, cells are somehow aware of their situation, of what is happening inside them, and also they are aware of what is happening in their environments and in other neighboring cells. And uh, <clears throat> so this is a very important goal for, for the modern cell biology. Um, the goal is to understand how cells uh, actually gain this knowledge and how they can use this knowledge or how they use this knowledge for their daily uh, routine functions. Okay, now I'm going to explain uh, and introduce uh, some basic concepts in cell signaling. So, what is biosignaling uh, in the first place? Well, uh, biosignaling is all about the communication between cells and other cells and a cell with its environment. Sometimes you can see as biosignaling as the communication between the whole organism and its environment. Okay, for example, the information we get by our uh, sensory organs is just a sort of communication between uh, different stimuli uh, <clears throat> in our environment and uh, us as as organisms. So uh, 
yeah, that's all about the com uh, communication between cells or the organisms in the environment. And uh, cells, you know, need some symbolic representations um, of what is happening uh, in their environments or in other uh, cells. I'm going to explain what, what do I mean by symbolic representations. But cells need cell signaling or communication and uh, they need to interact with their environments and uh, with, uh, with, uh, <clears throat> with, their, with other cells, with their neighbors. Uh, uh, for, you know, this, this communication is very crucial for their uh, growth, differentiation, uh, division, uh, metabolism, homeostasis. You know, it's basically very important for every single function a cell has um, and has to uh, perform. So, <clears throat> it's very important. But what are biosignals then? Um, I just mentioned that, uh, you know, uh, cells need symbolic representations. Biosignals are not those symbolic representations. Signals in biology are just information about the environment. Information about the changes, actually, that occur, uh, occur in the environment. Many people would think that, uh, you know, a ligand or a single molecule is a signal. Well, um, I believe it's just a vehicle for the signal. Uh, it's a symbolic representation of a signal. Because, you know, saying a, <clears throat> a ligand is just like, a, a, a ligand is a signal, just like saying that uh, genes are made out of DNA. And DNA, or DNA is made out of uh, uh, genes. Genes are pieces of information. And DNA or RNA are just vehicles for that, for the, for that information, okay? So signals are information which are represented to cells symbolically via small molecules or large molecules via chemical substances, so-called messengers or ligands. So that's the definition of biosignals. Uh, where do those signals come from? Very good question. Uh, <clears throat> first of all, let's talk about this, uh, the nature of signals. They can be physical, of course, and they can be chemical. Physical signals, um, for instance, um, uh, changes in temperature, changes in pressure, the light that we receive by our eyes, these are all the examples of physical signals that are received by our uh, sensory organs. But sometimes, you know, uh, there are some chemical uh, signals. For example, the smells, uh, the, the odors that we smell, uh, the flavors that we taste, the hormones inside our body's neurotransmitters, they are examples of chemical signals. So signals can be, uh, can come from a physical or a chemical nature. And uh, signals can come from outside of the organism or from within the organism. So <clears throat> the examples I gave you in for physical signals, um, for example, the light which, uh, which is received by our uh, light uh, receptors in our eyes, well, it's an example of an outside uh, signal, something that is produced, a signal which is produced for, uh, outside of the body is uh, received by the body. But some signals, as I uh, again uh, gave you some examples, hormones, cytokines, neurotransmitters, they are produced inside the organism. So they can come from within, okay? Um, a common term uh, in many signal transduction textbooks or signal biosignaling textbooks is the signal transduction pathway. So what is a signal transduction pathway? A signal transduction pathway is actually a chain of chemical reactions between biomolecules inside a cell. So, <clears throat> simply explaining, uh, when a signal is received by a cell, that signal uh, or, the, or its receptor, its particular receptor, initiates a chain of chemical reactions between biomolecules and proteins and different enzymes in the cell, which ultimately leads to 
uh, to a response from a cell. Okay, so that is a signal transduction pathway. We are going to actually uh, <coughs> examine some examples of common signal transduction pathways. Um, I think I mentioned that signal transduction pathways can sometimes get very messy and complicated, and there are various types of signal transduction pathways. But uh, no matter how varied and how variable they are, <coughs> there are three or four uh, key components of every single signal transduction pathway. The first component is the signal itself. Obviously, but, you know, when there's no signal, it's not going to be that chain of reaction. Um, in the cell. So signal is a very first key component in every single signal transduction pathway. Then we're going to have a receptors. You know, we need receptors. Receptors are really, really crucial. You know, there, there can be a cell which, can, which is bombarded with different signals, but if uh, that cell doesn't express the appropriate receptor uh, for, for a particular signal, it's not going to um, respond to those signals. Okay? So Receptors are also important. But as I told you, uh, in any signal transduction pathway, we have a chain of chemical reactions between biomolecules. And, you know, there's a circuit of biomolecules. Um, and so we need uh, a chain of molecules and uh, enzymes and proteins between the, <coughs> uh, in order to transduce the signal from the receptor, okay, to the inside. Uh, protein machinery. So, and those molecules or proteins are called transducers and effectors. I'm going to define them um, and elaborate on them later, but they're also important. There are uh, other uh, key components of, of signal, any signal transduction pathway. And at the end, we have a response, which is also a key component. I mean, uh, if, we, if a cell receives a signal but doesn't show any response, well, what's the whole purpose of signaling? So a response from a cell is also important. These are the four main uh, components of any signal transduction pathway. As I was researching for this lecture, for these lectures, um, I came upon a very uh, intriguing and interesting concept called wetware. The concept of the wetware was first introduced by uh, Dennis Bray, from University of Oxford in a book also called Wetware. The concept of Wetware uh, says that basically cells are like uh, microscopic and small computers in a sense that they can receive, decode, and encode, and send some signals. So in that sense, they're, they, they function as small little uh, microscopic computers. And, uh, <clears throat> you know, Electronic computers do this uh, signal analysis by a uh, circuit of electronic components. Cells, on the other hand, which are, I want to call them small organic computers, um, they do this uh, signal analysis uh, by a circuit of biomolecules. So uh, it's an interesting concept. Uh, I mean, uh, it's an interesting perspective to look at the cell signaling. Okay, so the communication between the cell and the organism. So this picture uh, indicates the uh, <coughs> cell signaling which happens inside the organism. You see the organism as the, uh, which is composed of cells and extracellular matrix. So some cells in some parts of the body are going to communicate with other cells in other parts of the body via the first messengers, although I'm going to, uh, you know, uh, explain first messengers later, but, you know, they can be, they can, uh, <coughs> you know, cells can communicate with different chemical signals inside the body. Uh, for example, they can communicate with hormones, uh, growth factors, cytokines, vasoactive agents, neurotransmitters, even some solid messengers in the extracellular matrix, action potentials of course, also. And uh, they're received by, uh, by a cell or a cluster of cells in other parts of the body 
And these first messengers are going to evoke some responses. On, uh, they can vary from secretion to contraction, depending on the type of cell and the type of receptors, and depending on many other factors, actually. The uh, beautiful thing here is that <clears throat> the receiving cell can send some feedback signals to the body. Okay, so, so, so there is a loop in cell signaling inside the body. It's just, it's just picturing a very a, overview of, of uh, what is happening inside the body. So, let's see what happens in a single cell when a signal is received. So, this picture, this picture uh, is an oversimplified uh, linear signal transduction pathway. I repeat it, oversimplified linear signal transduction pathway. Uh, it would suffice for the introduction, of course. So let's, let's see what happens here. Uh, you see the outside of the cell. Here's the outside. Here's the cytosolic side or the inside of the cell. You can see the cell membrane here. You can see an embedded receptor protein at the cell surface. And we have an extracellular signaling, signal molecule, okay? So this signal molecule, this red dot, is received by this uh, receptor. And then, as I told you, there are some intracellular uh, signal proteins, transducers and effectors. Here, these are transducers, which are going to transduce the signal from the receptor to effector proteins, or the protein machinery inside the cell. And you can see these arrows show, you know, they represent that chain of reactions, which is a characteristic feature of any signal transduction pathway. And then we have effector proteins. They can be metabolic proteins, which are going to alter the cell's metabolism. They can be uh, transcription factors, which are going to alter the gene expression or gene transcription. Uh, they can be uh, cytoskeletal proteins, which are going to change the shape or the movement of a cell. But anyway, they, uh, they're very, they're, they're various kinds of effector proteins. And at the end, we have an altered cell activity. This altered cell activity is considered as a cell's response to the signal. Sorry. Okay, so this, these altered cell activities are considered as the cell's response to the signal. I already labeled the, uh, those four important components of any signal transduction pathway. First, we have a signal, then we have a receptor, then we have transducers and effectors, and at the end, we're gonna have a response. Beautiful. Um, I wanna mention an important concept here. Um, in this case, you see there's an extracellular signal molecule. There are some signal molecules which are very large and also hydrophobic. Hydrophilic, sorry. They're hydrophilic and they're very large molecules. These signals need a cell surface receptor in order to uh, signal the receiver cell or the target cell. Because they can, they're too large to pass through the lipid bilayer and they're also hydrophobic, hydrophilic, sorry. So they cannot pass through the hydrophobic lipid bilayer. However, we have some signal molecules, which are very small, tiny, and they're hydrophobic. Because they're small and hydrophobic, they can pass through the lipid bilayer. So they are carried to the cell, to the target cell by carrier proteins, they pass through the lipid bilayer, bilayer, and their receiver is inside the cell. Sometimes the receiver is inside the nucleus of a cell. They have nuclear receptors. I'm going to explain different types of uh, receptors. So here you can see, uh, you know, a nuclear receptor. So, transducers and effectors. Uh, gonna 
uh, to define them for the last time. Transducers are mostly proteins or some molecules which are going to transduce the signal from the receptor to uh, proteins or enzymes which are responsible for the production or the release of second messengers. Although, I'm, uh, you know, I'm going to explain second messengers later, but uh, yeah. <clears throat> or to the effectors. And effector proteins are those enzymes which are responsible for the uh, production or the release of, uh, you know, signal intracellular signal molecules. That's, that's one way of defining transducers and effectors. Okay. Let's review what I already told you, and let's, uh, I want to mention a very important fact about signal transduction pathways. We already saw, uh, you know, this is, a, this is a summary of already told you, what I've already told you. Uh, we have some external and internal signals, okay, uh, going, uh, received by a target cell. We're going to have different types of uh, responses, mitosis, differentiation, division, uh, even cells death, apoptosis. Figure B shows uh, that chain of reactions that I already told you in a signal transduction pathway. You know, we have uh, each one of these arrows uh, represent a signal. It's going, it's going to uh, initiate a chain of reactions between biomolecules inside a cell, and then we're going to have a response. This figure is wrong. This is what happens in real cells. As you see, we have signals, but you can see different signal transduction pathways can interfere with each other, can have crosstalks with each other, they can interact with each other. And so the path between a signal and a receptor is not always linear. Because as I told you, signals, cells or target cells are bombarded with different signals and each one of those signals uh, is going to initiate uh, its own signal transduction pathway. So it's inevitable uh, that many of these uh, signal transduction pathways are going to interact with each other. The response is going to be based on the net result of these interactions. So this is what happens. This is a note. This is a very important fact that I wanted to mention. Uh, uh, this pi this uh, picture is the uh, nonlinearity in signaling path uh, pathways. Okay. Let's talk about different forms of intercellular signaling. Intercellular signaling is a signaling between cells, not with their environment cells, between two cells or a uh, bunch of cells. The first type is a contact dependent signaling, also called jaxacrine. Jaxta means, you know, jaxta position means uh, in close proximity. So <clears throat> when a signaling molecule is expressed at the surface of, of the signaling cell, we call this signaling contact dependent. And the target cell <clears throat> is going to express the, uh, the receptor again at its surface. So these two, so we have a signaling cell with, uh, with a signaling molecule at its surface. We have the uh, receiver cell or the target cell with its receptor at the surface and they're going to target each other and, and, and contact with each other. Sorry, they're, they're going to contact each other, uh, make contact, and uh, the cells should be in direct membrane contact. Okay? This type of signaling, I mean contact dependent or jastocrine signaling is important in immune responses and also in signaling between uh, developing cells. Another form is paracrine. Paracrine cell signaling is uh, signaling between a uh, cell and its neighboring cells. Okay, so the signaling cell is going to release some local mediators. Okay, so paracrine requires local mediators. It acts on the neighboring cells 
or the target cells which express the appropriate uh, receptor for that particular local mediator or signal molecule. Okay? Uh, simple, nothing very unusual. Uh, the kind of signaling, intracellular signaling, very, uh, you know, the favorite for, uh, for, for us, neuroscientists, uh, <clears throat> is the synaptic form. <sighs> I'm sorry I'm explaining this to you. Uh, you know, I'm just re uh, reviewing what I've already learned. I know that you are all masters, uh, professors of neuroscience. So we have a target cell, a presynaptic neuron, it's going to release some chemical uh, neurotransmitters in the synaptic cleft. And we're going to have a target cell. The target cell should not necessarily be another neuron. It can be a muscle cell, for example. Or it can be, uh, uh, you know, a bunch of, a uh, uh, you know, a cluster of cells or hormones. So we need uh, neurotransmitters. And uh, these are specialized for communication over large distances sometimes. And this dashed line along the length of the axon represents uh, the, uh, the variable length of the axon. You know, <clears throat> as I remember, uh, one of you professors actually mentioned this in the Ebrus course, that uh, there are some axons uh, with the length of as long as, as one, me one meter, some motor neurons, I guess. So they are, they are very effective for uh, communication over large distances. The other form is uh, endocrine, opposite of paracrine, somehow. Endocrine, in endocrine signaling, we have uh, a cluster of cells called glands, or gland, or the secreting cell, which is going to secrete some hormones, okay, or signals, into the bloodstream. Because the hormones or signal molecules are introduced into bloodstream, they're going to be, uh, <clears throat> they're going to spread throughout the whole body, and they're all again uh, very good for far, far and wide range uh, signaling, like like uh, the synaptic signaling, um, hormone and endocrine signaling are, is very good for uh, signaling over large distances, and the target cells. They can be um, everywhere in the body. Their target cells should also should just uh, you know express the appropriate receptor for that hormone, and they're going to receive it, and they're going to respond to that. There's one more form, which is the autocrine. Auto means self, and autocrine means self signaling. What happens in self signaling is that when the signaling mo uh, signaling cell expresses the, the receptor itself. So it's actually going to send some signals, since it uh, expresses the receptor itself, it's going to receive, the, receive its signals. So it's self-signaling. And thus, uh, it can apply to all of these forms. You know, for example, in paracrine, you look at this uh, signaling cell here. It, uh, it sends some local mediators. What if, there, what if this signaling cell represents, uh, sorry, expresses the uh, appropriate receptor? So it's going to receive its local mediators. It's going to signal itself. Autocrine uh, is important in cancer uh, signaling, and cancer cells uh, usually have autocrine signaling for their uh, self proliferations. So, uh, that was about the forms of intercellular signaling. Messengers in cell signaling. At the beginning of this lecture, I, uh, I explained that cells, uh, you know, receive signals as symbolic representations. Messengers are those symbolic representations, those molecules uh, those chemical substances which are 
uh, which represent signals symbolically to cells. There are various kinds. Uh, there are two general category, categories of messengers. First messengers. Well, first messengers are extracellular signal molecules. They can come from outside the organism or inside the organism, but they're extracellular. They're not inside a cell. So, uh, I already defined them actually. They're extracellular signal uh, molecules. They have different generic names. Uh, actually, I mentioned some of their names uh, when I, uh, in the slide uh, in which I explained different forms of intercellular signaling. I mentioned some of the generic names for first messengers. Uh, Cell surface signal molecules, they're also called uh, you know, solid signal molecules. Uh, local mediators, hormonal factors, uh, neurotransmitters. So these are all general uh, inflammatory uh, factors or, or um, communication media. These are all different names of, of first messengers. They also come in a variety of forms. They can be gas molecules, they can be nucleotides, single nucleotides, they can be uh, small or large proteins. Uh, yeah, they can be, they come in various different, uh, various forms. And uh, <clears throat> one important fact about their ultimate effect. The ultimate effect of a first messenger is not defined by the nature of the first messenger, but by the anatomical context in which, the in which the first messenger is introduced and also by the nature or the mechanism of action of the receptor uh, which receives that first messenger. That's why, for example, a same first messenger molecule or a signal molecule is used in different parts of the body and evoke different responses. Okay, so that's very important about the ultimate effect of first messengers. Examples, um, hormones. There are um, hydrophobic hormones, I'm going to uh, actually uh, give you some examples of them. Growth and differentiation factors. Um, in the, you know, in, in other lectures in this series, I'm going to actually uh, tell you, uh, give you some examples of a growth factor and how it, uh, it bonds, uh, binds to, the, to its receptor. Neurotransmitters, chemical neurotransmitters, cytokines, inflammatory um, mediators, and vasoactive agents. Solid first messengers, solid first messengers in 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 um, in contact dependent uh, <coughs> inter intercellular signaling. We had solid first messengers. Okay, they they were solid. They they were uh, attached to the surface of a receptor. They were not. Uh, uh, you know, those uh, signals were not diffused in a, uh, in a media, they were attached to a cell. Or, or uh, there are some proteins in the extracellular matrix which can act as first messengers or signal molecules as well. I already mentioned this, that there are some signal molecules which are um, hydrophobic and small, thus they can pass through the hydrophobic lipid bilayer of the membrane of the plasma membrane. So they're, uh, they're uh, introduced to the target cell by carrier proteins, and then they have uh, nuclear receptors or intracellular receptor proteins inside the cell. Uh, you can see here some examples of those small um, hydrophobic signal molecules. Uh, look at all of them, they're all small molecules and they're hydrophobic and uh, because of these carbon chains and carbon rings you know that's why they're hydrophobic and they're mostly a small okay <sighs> okay we saw a similar figure at the beginning but here um, I want to uh, elaborate on um, an important fact. You know, here we have a sender 
or, or a signaling cell which sends some signals, okay, signals or first messengers to the target cells which are also called receiver cells. They have appropriate uh, receptors at their surface. That's why they can receive the signal. You can see a non-receiver which, which is not a target cell because it doesn't uh, uh, express the appropriate receptor for that uh, particular uh, signal. There are going to be different... Uh, so the first, the signal is decoded. Uh, the cell is going to understand its meaning and encode the signal. Different responses, migration can be a response, secretion even. So you can see the receiver here when it secretes some uh, first messengers, so the receiver cell is now a sender cell or a signaling cell. It's going to send some signals or first messengers. And then the sender messenger, the very first one, is now a receiver cell. This picture shows a loop and an interdependence uh, in cell signaling. There's no hierarchy in cell signaling. You know, it's all a loop. And there's a bottom-up approach also in cell signaling. This picture, sh uh, this figure shows and uh, indicates that bottom-up approach. And also indicates that there's no hierarchy in cell signaling. Second messengers. Uh, so first messengers were extracellular signal molecules. Second messengers there are intracellular cellular signal molecules. There are some signal molecules which are produced inside the cell. After a cell uh, receives a, uh, a first messenger, it's going some, sometimes uh, a cell is going to reproduce some intracellular signal molecules, which are called second messengers. Second messengers are a small signal molecules which are reproduced inside the cell in large quantities in order to amplify this, uh, the message by the first messenger. So it's very important. So two features, small, intracellular, and also um, in large quantities, uh, they're produced in large quantities in order to uh, amplify the signal um, received by the first messenger. Again, they have different forms. Uh, for example, you know, uh, cyclic AMP, I'm going to define um, other uh, different types, I'm going to talk about different types of second messengers. Cyclic AMP, IP3, DAG, there are different types and different forms of them. They can be, uh, you know, they can be uh, single ions such as calcium ion, or they can be uh, lipid derived uh, uh, parts of phospholipids, so on. One important fact about resolubility is that uh, we have water soluble. Uh, second messengers such as CAMP, CGMP, um, calcium ions, and we have lipid soluble ones such as diacylglycerol or DAG, which are um, which stay along the uh, membrane, lipid membrane. So, cyclic adenosine monophosphate or CAMP is is an example of a, a second messenger. Let's see how it is produced. First, we have an ATP, ATP molecule, adenosine triphosphate. We have uh, adenine, ribose, and three phosphate groups. An enzyme called adenyl cyclase is going to uh, remove two of these phosphate groups and turn this ATP into a CAMP or cyclic AMP. This is called cyclic because, because of its this part. Then, by other enzymes, it can uh, transform to AMP, or adenosine monophosphate. This is how it's produced. This molecule here, cyclic AMP, is used as a second messenger inside the cell. And we are going to uh, <coughs> review some basic signal pathways, or signal transduction pathways, in which cyclic AMPs are produced and act as second messengers. Uh, you know, I included this figure because, um, <clears throat> you know, I want to, uh, how can I say that? You know, let's, let's explain what it is. You know, it's, 
it shows uh, the production of CAMP as a result of uh, <clears throat> introducing serotonin, a, a, a neurotransmitter, into, the, into a cell. So this is a neuron, and this is before 5-HT, 5-hydroxytryptamine, or and this is another name for serotonin. This is 19 seconds after 50 micromolar of uh, serotonin when it is introduced. And this, uh, this uh, um, yellow color here represents the production of CAMP. And this is uh, 49 seconds. And as we go on, uh, it, it gets back to its basal uh, state. I included this to show you, uh, to illustrate the concepts of first messengers and second messengers. In this case, 5-HT or 5 hydroxytryptamine or serotonin acts as a first messenger, received by the cell, and then a second messenger, cyclic AMP, is, uh, is produced inside the cell. So cyclic AMP is actually going to be considered as an intercellular signal molecule. Uh, you know, I'm going to show you the exact signaling pathway uh, in which is, uh, CAMP is produced and how it is produced uh, by introducing 5-hydroxytryptamine uh, or serotonin. Phospholipids are second messengers. Let's see how phospholipids can can, can be turned into second messengers. So we have a phosphatidyl inositol. It's a phosphat uh, phospholipid. It has, uh, you, you see this hydrocarbon um, hydrophobic chain in the membrane. We have an inositol part. Um, there are some enzymes which are going to add some, phosph some extra phosphate groups, okay? And we have this uh, PI biphosphate, okay? This altered phospholipid is cleaved, actually, by, uh, by an enzyme, a very key enzyme, uh, a key enzyme here, a very important enzyme, phospholipase C, into diacylglycerol, or DAC, and inositol triphosphate, 145 triphosphate, or IP3. As you see, this DAC, because of these hydrocarbon tails, is hydrophobic. So it just stays in the membrane, is a lipid bilayer of the membrane, and it acts as an individual second messenger. And we have this uh, IP3, and because of these negative charged, negatively charged uh, phosphate groups, it's, it's uh, of course hydroph uh, hydrophilic, and so it diffused into the cell, it is diffused, uh, diffuses into the cell, and it also acts as an individual signal, uh, second messenger, in different signal pathways. So the DAC uh, is involved in a signal transduction pathway which is going to activate uh, protein kinase C, uh, a type of kinase enzymes, and IP3 is going to release calcium ions in, in the cell. And calcium ions are in turn second messengers. So they are involved in different signal transduction pathways. And this is how they are produced. I'm not going to throw every single one of these uh, because of the lack of time, for the sake of time, I'm not going to throw all of them. Ligands. What are ligands? Again, a good question. Uh, sorry, I, you know, I'm very thirsty. Ligands are chemical substances which bind to receptors. Simple. <clears throat> How many types do we have for ligands? Since ligands are symbolic representations of signals, and since signals can come from outside or inside, ligands can be endogenous. It means that they're produced inside the the organism and the operating side. It can be exogenous, which means that they're produced by something else outside and they come into the cell 
in, into the body, they're, they're received by the body. So exogen is outside or inside, basically. What is ligand binding? Ligand binding is the mechanism uh, in which a ligand is attached or is received by a receptor, by its appropriate receptor. It's also called receptor occupation. When a receptor binds to a ligand, we, call, we, we say that the receptor is occupied by a ligand molecule. Size. Ligands come uh, in various sizes. They can be very small, okay, like small hormone molecules. Um, they can be as large as, as, as proteins. Okay, so uh, they come in various sizes. Affinity. Affinity is very important. So, uh, we have low affinity ligands. Low affinity, it means that they are, they don't, they, 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 uh, they don't have a lot of attraction. There's, no, there's not a lot of attraction between the ligand and the receptor. So, when a ligand is attached, okay, by accident to, to a receptor, because there's not a lot, of, a lot of affinity or attraction, it's going to actually detach from it. So, um, low affinity ligands <coughs> must... Uh, they, they actually substitute each other, okay, a lot, and they must be uh, present in high concentrations. The benefit of low concentration, low affinity ligands, is that, uh, is, it, is, is, the, is the reversibility, okay, because there's literal uh, affinity between the ligand molecule and the receptor, and you can have fast on and off switches with low affinity ligands, okay? So, uh, whenever you need, uh, you know, reversibility in cell signaling or fast on and off switches, fast signaling, uh, you can use uh, low affinity ligands. I mean, the body can use, actually. High affinity uh, ligands, on the other hand, uh, you know, they, they, <clears throat> there's, uh, they form very strong bonds. Uh, not covalent bonds, but very strong non-covalent bonds, such as uh, uh, electrostatic bonds between the, with, the, with the receptors. And so, uh, an advantage of them is that uh, you don't need a lot of those high affinity ligands. Uh, even a few uh, high affinity ligands can, can uh, occupy a good number of receptors. Benefit? Well, efficiency. Okay? They're very efficient. So, if, if efficiency is important for you, uh, use high affinity ligands. Okay, let's compare the sizes. Actually, I prepared um, a size comparison. Here you can see a ligand, a hormone, adrenaline, okay? It's only 184 Dalton. And this is its uh, appropriate receptor, beta-2 adrogenic receptor. You can see the receptor in the cell membrane here. Okay, it's embedded in the cell membrane. And here is the uh, ligand binding site in the receptor, okay? You can see it's very small, okay? Compared to epidermal growth factor, or EGF, uh, with the molecular mass of 6,000 Daltons. So large. And this is uh, epidermal growth factor receptor here, okay? You can see it is not embedded in the cell, it's actually expressed at the cell surface, at the surface of the liquid bilayer. And this is the um, EGF binding site, okay? And, and you can see, uh, you can scale adrenaline, okay, and you can compare it with the uh, EGF. So, ligands come in various sizes. Last topic, <coughs> receptors. So we talked about messengers, first messengers, second messengers, ligands, all of those signal molecules. Now it's time to talk about receptors. We have different types of receptors. What are receptors? Basically, let me tell you something. Um, <coughs> receptors are transducers. They transduce the signal from outside to the inside. So. First of all, there are transducers. Second important thing about receptors is that receptors are basically uh, 
they're, they're all proteins first. And because they're proteins, they oscillate between different conformational states. They're not solid structures. Some of those conformational states uh, that receptors have correspond to their active state. What is an active state for a receptor? Uh, the active state of a receptor is the state in which the receptor can interact with other molecules or other uh, proteins inside the cell, for example, uh, transducers, okay? So they have active states, but they're not always interactive states. They oscillate between different conformational states, conformational uh, conformations and uh, 3D structures, but in some of those conformations, they actually have the ability to, uh, to contact uh, or interact with other proteins inside a cell, and those conformational states correspond to their actives. Um, in general, based on where those uh, receptors are located, we have cell surface receptors, okay, which are embedded in the membrane, they're, at the, they're present at the uh, surface of a cell, and we have intercellular receptors or nuclear receptors inside the nucleus. For those, as you remember, small uh, uh, hydrophilic molecules which can pass through the uh, lipid binder. But we can also uh, classify uh, receptors in more detail uh, by their transduction mechanism. So in that case, we have uh, ion channels or ionotropic receptors. Uh, they're also called transmitter-gated ion channels or receptors. And a transmitter is actually that signal molecule, that first messenger, which is going to activate or received by these receptors is going to open the channel, ion channel. For example, in this case, there's, a, there's, a, uh, there's an ion channel which, uh, which uh, receives uh, acetylcholine, and the acetylcholine uh, is received by this, causes a conformational change in the receptor, so the channel, the ion channel opens and ions can pass through the cell. There are also multipass uh, proteins, it means they pass through the lipid bilayer multiple times. There are multiple alpha helices pass through the lipid bilayer multiple times. Another example of multipass proteins is G protein coupled receptors. There are receptors which are coupled with, a, with our, which are attached to a G protein. In the next lecture, I'm actually going to, uh, there's a whole uh, lecture on G proteins actually. I'm going to explain G proteins later. And when they receive adre adrenaline, for example, in this, uh, in this case, the signal is adrenaline. Uh, when, they, uh, what, when the adrenaline uh, is received by this uh, G protein copper receptor, this, this receptor is going to activate G protein. And the G protein is, 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 is going to act as a transducer, okay? So it's actually going to uh, <clears throat> affect some effector proteins affect some effector proteins. And, and then, so, yeah. This is also multiple pass. Uh, G protein coupled receptors are also multiple pass uh, uh, receptors because they have seven alpha helices. They pass through the uh, lipid boilers um, seven times. We have enzyme-coupled receptors. So there are some receptors which are coupled with an enzyme. Sometimes the enzyme is an intrinsic part or domain of the receptor itself, okay? For example, the receptor for epidermal growth factor, we already saw that, uh, has an intrinsic kinase domain. A kinase is an enzyme which uh, attaches a, adds a phosphate group to another protein or not a molecule. So we have a kinase as an intrinsic domain of this receptor. Sometimes 
we have um, a, a receptor, we have an attached um, enzyme, but it's, this enzyme is not, uh, it's not an intrinsic domain or part of the um, receptor itself. These two are also uh, different types of enzyme coupled receptors and different types of uh, receptors. And we have uh, nuclear receptors, which are located in the nucleus of a cell, and they receive very small molecules, and uh, <clears throat> they mostly act on, activate uh, transcription factors, okay, to alter the gene expression and gene transcription in, in, in the cell, in the nucleus. That was... Um, the first lecture in this series, uh, Biocycling 1.1, I explained, I introduced uh, some basic concepts. I explained what are, uh, uh, I gave you an overall view of signaling in, 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 in individual cells and also in the whole organism. Um, I introduced ligands, receptors, dif um, different types of receptors, different, uh, talked about different types of ligands, um, talked about messengers. And uh, so, thank you so much for watching this lecture. I hope you can watch other videos and other lectures in this series as well. And uh, that's it. Thank you.